We have the mummy bundle, again, of Mercury, but it's the uh, dog god has emerged now because actually uh, Mercury emerged during the period represented on this page. And it's simply, you know, one of these things that they're tracking two major planetary gods and two gods that are considered to be twins in a way because they have a similar trajectory. So when we see this uh, ball of ashes explode, we see that uh, Quetzalcoatl, this time in his stripe-eyed variant, uh, he basically has a stripe eye, and people had pondered over what this means, but um, he appears only in the narrative during the rainy season. And so I, I think consider him to be a rainy season manifestation of Venus, and it's another attempt at showing seasonality. Hummingbirds, of course, are largely uh, feeding on flowers, uh, just to go back, and so they, they require uh, some uh, rainy season uh, plants to, to survive on. The ninth page, the page of the narrative um, refers to a festival called Etzkalitzli, which, which features uh, the rain god, and we see the rain god is stepping out on a, a row of clouds, and he has his rain vessel in his hand, but the rains might be delayed in this, in this year, and I would like to check this out with uh, some of the climate records that we have. Uh, for bald cypress and, uh, and from central Mexico, because it seems like the rains are not, he's not producing rain yet. Uh, his his uh, jar is dry and it has fire in it. But we do see other seasonal events, such as the flowered temple that's, hou that's housing the sun god, and he's playing a flute. And this is happening on the month of the summer solstice. And so that's kind of interesting. But we still uh, are looking at uh, patternings of descent. Um, and we also are looking at seasonality. And in the area of Mesoamerica, there's a marked seasonality. The rainy season begins in the fifth month, which is May, and um, essentially uh, peaks, or has a first peak in June. And so we actually can see this patterning in the uh, codex itself because Looking at pages, uh, the pages that we see on the, uh, in sequence, we'll, we'll see that there is some seasonality represented. But before we go to that, I want to show you that Xolotl's journey is also shown uh, in this series of pages 37 through 38. We have the dog god on top of the temple uh, when uh, Mercury reaches its maximum altitude on June 3rd, 1496. Uh, then he descends on that same page because it's only a 20-day period, but Mercury's like a rocket. It goes down, uh, uh, up and down. Um, and he's, he's perched in the jaws of the Earth monster uh, at the, by the bottom of the page. And on the following page, he actually tumbles off the path entirely. And we'll see that he then uh, is seen as a skeletal figure uh, on the following page. And the tenth page of the narrative uh, corresponds to what seems to be the beginning of the rains in, in earnest because we see Tlaloc at the bottom of the page. His jar now is, is producing water. It's bathing uh, a small figure that uh, is the stripe-eyed figure. And then the rains, you can't see it on the side here because apparently it's cut off on this, uh, but you can see it here. that that the, rains are, the rain clouds are rising up. So the rains are start in earnest um, and, and have, have really become heavy by this point, which is actually what does happen uh, in uh, June. The next uh, uh, thing I wanted to show you was how the parallel imagery of uh, Mercury, the dog god, and uh, Quetzalcoatl, the planetary god of Venus, how if you look at it over a five-day period, you actually, a uh, sequence of five-day periods, you can see that uh, the intervals from June 3rd, 1496, through uh, June 23rd, 1496, Mercury only, uh, you know, is seen four times, and then it drops. So it, by the time the fifth uh, positioning of Venus is recorded, in its slow movement down, Mercury's already below the horizon, so it's just a uh, much quicker trajectory, hence uh, the imagery is different. 
on page 11 of the narrative, we've got uh, the beginning of that eclipse image, but we still have images of descent that involve the Venus god, and here he's very close to a solar god because the Venus is approaching the sun, and he's surrounded by 12 goddesses who represent uh, the 12 mon lunar months of the year. And the 12th page of the narrative that we have already looked at shows the entire eclipse image with the stripe-eyed Quetzalcoatl figure being the central one attacking the sun, the rainy season aspect of Venus attacking the sun. And um, the entire scene takes place in an earth monster frame because the eclipse was so uh, profound and total that um, it, it appeared like the night, uh, uh, the day turned into night. So um, that uh, is one reason we see that kind of imagery. And in the uh, 13th page of the narrative, uh, we focus again on a Venus disk. A, a different, uh, it appears differently here, but it is a ray disk. And this is a, because at this point in time, Venus has approached the horizon and is very close to the sun, still visible, but very, very bright. By the bottom of the imagery, we see Venus getting ready for sacrifice. He's surrounded by two uh, lunar goddesses who are holding him. And uh, the, the next page, we actually see his sacrifice. And this is when Venus actually disappears again. Now, this time it disappears for a long interval. Uh, the longer interval that we are, uh, that is usually a 50 day uh, average uh, in, in superior conjunction when it moves behind the sun. So uh, the shorter interval at the beginning of the narrative was when it was in front, just uh, nine days, and behind it takes a long time to go around. So in this longer interval, we actually see all underworld imagery related to Venus. He's uh, tumbling into the jaws of the earth monster. Uh, he's tumbling on a ball court, obviously dead. Uh, and he uh, also is shown at a crossroads, completely dead. And but his transformative quality is shown because he actually has these tiny figures coming out um, who turn out to be little, little Mercury gods in the uh, uh, narrative. He, when Mercury transforms um, in this, after being invisible, he takes on a, uh, a different aspect, which um, you would have to see the way the day signs are shown in the beginning of the uh, calendar to know that this anthropomorphic image is also Xolotl, the dog god. It's a do another variation of the dog god. They're the same god. So uh, we could see that Mercury is transformed in this image by fire. Uh, it's often a transformational image that takes place, and we'll see that happens to uh, uh, the Venus god as well. And then he emerges out of the water when Mercury becomes uh, visible again. Uh, so this is a, another uh, attempt to show the Mercury cycle. Um, and then, because Mercury, Mercury is moving so quickly, uh, and uh, this time of year uh, uh, particularly, it, it's visible for so little time, by the time we get to this page, the next page in the narrative, um, Mercury is actually joining the Sun again uh, in conjunction, and also Venus, which is now invisible. And so by October 4th, um, about midway through this month, you see the dog god covered by the solar disk, and uh, yet he's not completely uh, without traits related to, to the Venus god um, because he has some uh, uh, traits that are related to uh, serpent images that relate to the Venus god's name is Quetzalcoatl, feathered serpent. At the bottom of the page, we see a, a, an image that shows a death goddess wearing a lot of uh, maize plants, and we see maize plants all the way around. And the maize harvest is taking place at this point, and all of the gods are being fed by uh, the ground up corn that uh, is now available in, in full force. And it all takes place in a solar frame because all of this is in the realm of the sun. It's not, it's not on the, uh, above the horizon, it's actually while the sun is in, in conjunction with both Mercury and uh, Venus, that the harvest takes place in this year. That wouldn't have to be true every year, but uh, this is in this particular year. And then the 16th page of the narrative shows another conjunction image that shows the sun, but this time on 
a goddess that we know is a lunar goddess, uh, Soshi Quetzal. Uh, I've done a study of her imagery, and she's the bride of the sun. And repeatedly, she seems to refer to the new moon uh, as the bride of the sun, which is, uh, she's a, a bit of a harlot because she leaves the sun and goes off every month and goes and visits other planets, but she comes back to him. So she's considered to be married to him, but she's not, uh, she's not necessarily a good wife. Um, anyway, she is shown here with the sun in their uh, com combined uh, image, and then also we see the, the uh, Venus god uh, here dressed um, a, as a hummingbird, and we see bats. We see a variety of images, but it still kind of takes place in a realm that is not uh, a visible realm because the flowered border suggests that we are in the realm of the sun also. And the, the other subtext of this particular image is that it compares very well with an image of, of a festival called Atamal Kualitzli that took place every eight years. And it was a Venus festival because every eight years, the sun and Venus do the same thing. Now, over the long term, you have to adjust. But generally speaking, if you see Venus emerge on the, the uh, summer solstice, your next time you'll see that occur uh, for, say, first visibility after uh, inferior conjunction, you're going to see it eight years later, which is not a long time to learn a cycle. And that's what we uh, think might be going on in this page, that, that we might actually also have a reference to the Atamal Kualitzli ceremony, which took place in the month of Waipaktli, which is also referenced in this image. So the 17th uh, page of the narrative is, is one that still refers to Venus invisible in the underworld. It's not yet reemerged because it's the longer period of superior conjunction. And the Venus god here takes on a guise of the hunting god, uh, Kamakshli. And uh, it's been recognized for quite a while that the hunting god, Mishkoatl and uh, Kamakshli, both have some kind of relationship with Venus and um, particularly the god of the morning star. So this skeletal image seems to be the invisible morning star. At the bottom of the page, you have the decapitated morning star represented with these quinquex designs on his face. And then we have the emerging figure of the uh, black Quetzalcoatl. And he's covered by a, a bundle, which is a funerary bundle. He's not yet visible. And indeed, Venus is not yet visible. But uh, he also has this unusual uh, uh, excrement, shall we say, that bloody excrement that can be explained by the uh, place, placement of this uh, particular page in the narrative in November. These are the November meteor showers. And the uh, Aztecs called the meteors the excrement of the gods. So the final page in the narrative actually is one that we have seen before with the emergence of the, uh, e uh, the evening star. And, but before he's emerging, he's got to be transformed. And that's usually taking place with fire. He then is presented as a little baby. He then comes out, and he drills uh, a fire on the back of the fire serpent. And you say, OK, uh, what's a fire serpent? <laughs> you know, what, does, what is it really? Well, um, I've often wondered whether we cannot say that the fire serpent is actually a specific constellation. And um, in looking at a number of repeated patterns, and this is another one that confirms it, think of your horizon here. The, uh, and of course, uh, Venus is now separated enough from the sun to, uh, to be visible. Uh, but the sun is sitting right on Scorpius, which is a beautiful curve of stars. And if you see Aztec iconography, they actually show the fire serpent with a series of seven stars in a row. So I, I believe they actually are looking uh, at a constellation here as well. Um, and so then just my final uh, words on this is that, that you, in order to approach this particular narrative, Edward Saylor long ago recognized that you had to use astronomy. It, it's an imperative to use astronomy because it's the only way you can understand the manuscript it's, or this section of the manuscript. It's full of uh, astronomical imagery. And, but you also must understand the relationship to the Aztec and Tlaxcalan calendar. 
And so decoding the, the imagery has been uh, really involved four different uh, aspects. One of them, uh, recognizing eclipse imagery that I showed you earlier. Another, recognizing Ventana or festival calendar imagery, such as the fire serpents representing the Panketsalitsi festival. And uh, the seasonality represented in visual images and changes in Venus imagery. Those have been very important. And just um, as I went along, I was looking for what other confirmation can we find of this. And I found to my uh, delight that when Venus was crossing through the Milky Way and still invisible, uh, it is shown on this strip goddess, who I've long thought was related to the Milky Way because of, she wears a star skirt, and that's the name of the Milky Way in Aztec culture. But Venus is covered, the Venus god is covered. He's behind a skeletal figure. And by the bottom of the page, when he's emerged, he appears in the skeletal, uh, in the uh, uh, strip goddess, but here without the skeletal imagery and actually uh, is visible in the Milky Way, which is, of course, what we saw on the previous uh, page where he's positioned, uh, the Venus god is positioned within the Milky Way. So that's how I. Uh, attempted to decode this, and I really think um, that I cracked the code. <laughs> All right, thank you. Any questions?